Welcome to the Nebraska History Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Goforth. Each episode, we explore articles written and published in the Nebraska History Magazine. Our guest today is no stranger to writing. An Omaha-based writer, Leo Adam Biga authored the book, Alexander Payne, His Journey in Film. He's also written over a thousand articles for dozens of newspapers and magazines over his 40-year career. He's also the author of the Nebraska History Magazine article, When Hollywood Came to Western Nebraska in 1968, published in the 2023 winter issue of the Nebraska History Magazine. Leo, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity. So in that little intro there, we hit a couple of uh, key things. You've written a lot of different articles over your career, and you've covered a lot of different subjects. You've, you've talked about the Omaha Stockyards, regional baseball, all the way up to presidential inaugurations. So tell us, where did you develop your passion for writing about the arts and film? Well, I guess uh, I'm a film buff from way back, you know, from uh, middle childhood on. And that was probably the key passion in my life for a long time. You know, eventually I got my journalism degree from UNO. I started before working as a freelance journalist, first in public relations at the Jocelyn Art Museum. So that was the first time that I combined my skill set as a journalist with with the arts in, in any kind of major way. And then I was freelancing as a journalist, but not not covering the arts whatsoever. But at the same time, I was still developing my my interest in cinema as a film programmer at uh, my alma mater, the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I ran a film series on campus for many years, and I was involved in film programming uh, at the Jocelyn to an extent, and also with an organization called the New Cinema Cooperative or New Cinema Co-op, which was kind of the forerunner of Filmstream many many years uh, prior to Filmstreams forming, and so I eventually combined my my passion for film with my journalism, largely through the figure of Alexander Payne. So I did my first interview with him in, uh, I think, 1996 or 97. He was prepping his second feature at that point, Election. But I had actually programmed his student thesis film, The Passion of Martin, several years before <laughs> at the New Cinema Co-op when we had a... a, a small uh, north downtown theater. So once I started uh, reporting on pain, you know, I became more emboldened to cover more arts. And some of that was, you know, my pursuing these subjects. And in other cases, I was getting these assignments from editors for various publications, primarily the reader newspaper. I was associated with the reader as a contributing writer for uh, 27 years, 28 years. And a lot of people knew my work from from, from the reader. But yeah, I, I wrote enough about Alexander Payne eventually to come out with a compilation of my journalism about him in 2016, the, 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 the book that you referenced in the intro. And I, I continue to report on him uh, to the extent that I can, but, but also many, many other Nebraskans in film, television, media, entertainment. And so that's, that's just a, a particular interest of mine that I continue to cultivate. So you mentioned Alexander Payne, of course, for those that don't know, is from Nebraska and uh, has had a number of his films featured and filmed here in Nebraska as well. The article we're talking about from the Nebraska History Magazine looks back at another film that was shot in Nebraska, The Rain People. What do you think is the appeal of Nebraska to filmmakers? Oh, I think, you know, potentially there's a lot of appeal. I mean, you know, the, the geography, the terrain, the uh, the landscapes. You know, anyone who has seen Payne's film Nebraska can appreciate what a film artist uh, can do, not to mention uh, uh, you know, a still photographer or uh, uh, any kind of artist can do with the, uh, the, the landscapes. And, of course, that film is shot in black and white, and there's some just really stark but beautiful landscapes and skyscapes in that film. And so, you know, the, I, that's why, you know, the Cohen brothers, in part, I'm sure, chose Nebraska to film part of their ballad of Buster Scruggs in Nebraska. And why other filmmakers here and there choose the state. Yeah, I, I, I'm with a lot of people in that, you know, would like to see more, more films shot here. Be that as it may, the film 
a story in Nebraska History Magazine that led you to contact me for this podcast is, is the story of how some, at the time, not very well-known Hollywood figures, but who soon became very well-known figures in Hollywood, ended up in Ogallala, Nebraska in 1968. And that was for the, the production, the last four weeks of shooting on this Francis Ford Coppola feature, The Rain People, which he wrote and directed. And along for the ride, because it was a road picture, and it was very much a road experience in making the, uh, the movie, included a, a very young George Lucas, who was kind of Coppola's protege at the time. And it included uh, a very fine cinematographer, Bill Butler, who went on to do many famous films. And of course, the, the key actors in the film were Shirley Knight, uh, James Caan, and Robert Duvall. And that's, that particular production, The Rain People, was released in 1969. Uh, they, they came for the production to Ogallala in 68. You know, it was an art film. It wasn't widely seen. But, you know, we all know what happened it, within, you know, three years of that film's release. Francis Ford Coppola made The Godfather and was the king of Hollywood. And then, you know, Coppola ended up producing two of George Lucas's films. First feature, THX 1138, which starred Robert Duvall, and then uh, American Graffiti. So Coppola and, and uh, Lucas, they had this relationship that was partially built during the experience of the Rain People, including that time in Ogallala, which was several weeks. And they formed uh, Zoetrope Studios, now called American Zoetrope. And that's one of the points of my story, Chris, is that this unlikely intersection of these Hollywood figures with Nebraska ranch families ended up uh, having something to do with the emergence of Coppola and Lucas, for example, as leaders in the new Hollywood that emerged in the uh, in the, the, the late 60s, early 70s. And that's the story that I tell in the magazine is that that experience in Nebraska, it begat not just the rain people, it begat a film about the making of the rain people, which George Lucas shot and uh, eventually was titled Filmmaker, a diary by George Lucas, mainly focusing on Francis Coppola, his, uh, his mentor. And then it begat another film, a feature length documentary, Were Not the Jet Set, that Robert Duvall came back to shoot over the course of some years after the rain people. And it focused on a Nebraska ranch rodeo family, the Petersons. And that's a, that's a whole story unto its own. Because members of the Peterson family remained friends with Duvall, and several of them ended up in the Hollywood industry as yeah. wranglers and trainers on uh, many Hollywood films. And then there, one can even attribute a fourth screen work to that experience in Ogallala, a uh, Duvall-produced miniseries, Broken Trail, which he uh, starred in, and that was inspired by some true life tales of the famed Nebraska ranch family, the Haythorns. So it's, it's a rather am amazing confluence of talent that ended up in this unlikely place of Ogallala that had all these repercussions and resonances for many years after. Leo Adam Big is joining us on today's podcast, talking about his article in the Nebraska History Magazine, When Hollywood Came to Western Nebraska in 1968. You mentioned that The Rain People was a road movie, and it was filmed across the United States at various locations. From what I understand, Ogallala was just kind of selected out of happenstance. And is it true that was the, the place where they spent the most amount of time? I, I believe that's true, yeah, uh, in, uh, on both points. The uh, the production actually followed, you know, the, the narrative arc of the story. And so the Shirley Knight character is this disenchanted American housewife living in New Jersey, New York, thereabouts, who is pregnant, and she just picks up and hits the road in her car and starts having these adventures and experiences, and she winds up going down to the deep south and then 
heading west and then north up into the Midwest. And yeah, so, you know, Coppola had, you know, they, they were traveling as a, as a production uh, unit in a caravan of cars and trucks and whatnot across the country. And he always had someone scouting ahead for the next location. Uh, you know, they knew in general what they might be looking for, but they were open to inspiration. And then the scout, you know, came upon Ogallala. And then when Coppola saw it, he felt that it was, it was just right for what he wanted for that, that portion of the story. How was uh, Ogallala received by the cast and the crew? And you talked a little bit about uh, a couple of the ranch families in the area as well, but in general, how were the cast and crew received by the town? Well, if you look back at some of the, the reporting that was done then, which, which it, it, you know, there was reporting on, on this, <laughs> this strange uh, group of people, you know, uh, the, you know, the men, you know, they had beards and mustaches and long hair and you know, they, they kind of looked like hippies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's so, yeah, obviously, uh, most Nebraska towns, or for that matter, even cities, don't have much experience or intersection with, with, with Hollywood and, and in those parts especially. And so, uh, you know, they, they were kind of <laughs> viewed as uh, these strange visitors. But, you know, word got around about why they were there. And, of course, there was interest in that and reporting down on it by local media. And even the World Herald sent somebody out. And, and then in terms of how the uh, cast and crew, you know, responded to, uh, you know, these Western figures, so to speak, that they came upon, you know, I think they were uh, charmed by them. In particular, the two actors, Duval and Khan, you know, they were already kind of both into horses. They'd already made, uh, I think each had made a Western or two by that time. Mm-hmm. And Duval had a long history with horses because of an uncle of his that he spent time with as a boy. And so anyway, they were predisposed to be open to these Westerner characters. And when they met the Peterson family, this, this ranch rodeo family, who traveled extensively themselves doing trick writing, you know, they just fell right in with them and, and the family right in with, with the actors. They got on like gangbusters and, and that led to this ever deepening relationship, which led to uh, Duvall's documentary uh, film project, uh, We're Not the Jet Set. And it sounds like uh, Duvall's relationship with his family wasn't a, a short-lived relationship. It is still something even to this day that he recalls and, and speaks of fondly. It's true. Yeah, I you know I've had the pleasure of speaking to him a, a number of times over the years. When I whenever I bring up you know the Rain People and we're not the Jet Set and bring up the Petersons, it, it's clear that uh, he does have some fond memories. And I mean, he's even had ve- I know very very recent contact with at least one member of the Petersons, Rex Peterson, who went on to this prolific, still ongoing career as a, as a wrangler for Hollywood movies. And I mean, he's been on many large productions over many decades. So there is still that bond. Um, you know, he, he lost touch with, <clears throat> I think, most of the, the family. And uh, most of the family lost touch with Duvall over time. But uh, that, that's not to say that there, there still aren't these warm feelings, although it should be mentioned that not every member of the Peterson family is uh, feels positive about the way they were portrayed in this documentary. And, and, and I wish your readers could see this documentary, but unfortunately, it's, it's largely been out of circulation since its release in the late 70s. But it's a very raw, unadorned portrait of this family and it's a very politically incorrect (laughs) movie in the best kind of way because it's showing these people in a completely unvarnished way and so some of the members of the family they were completely fine with that it's like well this is who we are and you're portraying us honestly some to this day are uh, a a little less uh, enthusiastic about it leo adam mega joining us he's the author of the nebraska history magazine article when hollywood came to western nebraska in 1968 you mentioned earlier another family that had an impact on the actors probably most notably with james Kahn was the the haythorn family and it seemed like the experiences that james had really kind of influenced him as an actor for future films yeah he 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 said so himself and and for that matter duval that these experiences with with these families and, and, and so uh, getting to what you're kind of referring to, Chris, both actors had a chance to participate, particularly Khan, with things like brandings and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, 
gropings and, and all of that. So they, they kind of, you know, as actors do, they, they like to kind of uh, immerse themselves in, in other people's lives. And, and as I said, both, both of those actors just happen to enjoy horses in the West and, and all that. So yeah, Khan, he got to do a lot of that. He really felt, you know, that he was taken in by them and, and shown this, this side of life. And I know he, so he always appreciated that, how kind they were to him, how accepting they were of this, of this hotshot actor, <laughs> um, uh, who did his best to, you know, to be a cowboy for real life with them. <laughs> and, and Duvall definitely talks about how meeting these people and spending time with them definitely gave him insights to play some of the, you know, the great Western characters that he ended up playing in, in film and television, including his famous uh, character in Lonesome Dove. Mm-hmm. Well, Leo, your, your work on this article is part of a larger body of work examining Nebraska in film. As you said, this is something that's been a passion of yours. As you've gone on this journey, looking at the crossroads between the state and the film industry, what are some of the other stories that have really stood out to you? Well, I don't have so much to report on uh, other, other you know, instances of Hollywood coming to Nebraska, but I do have an upcoming story in Nebraska History Magazine about a Nebraska native filmmaker, the late Joan Micklin Silver, whom uh, unfortunately most Nebraskans have never heard of, but she produced a remarkable body of work, particularly in the 1970s and 80s. She was a feature filmmaker, a writer-director, and her very first feature film, Hester Street, which I believe was released in 1975, which is now in the National Film Registry, by the way, is this remarkable black and white, very evocative period piece about Jewish immigrants on the Lower East Side of New York. That film has a great reputation, but it, 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 it's important for, for a few reasons, one of, one of which is that it was made by Joan and financed by her and her husband, Ray, themselves for less than four hundred thousand dollars they made this exquisite movie and ended up grossing uh this was with them distributing the film themselves because hollywood not, wanted nothing to do with it it ended up grossing in 1970 dollars 10 million dollars wow at the box office so it was one of the most uh remarkable and phenomenal indie films up to that point in america and because she was a woman writer director at a time when you could literally count on one hand the number of women who were, and, and I use this term on purpose, who were allowed to direct by the all male patriarchy of Hollywood, uh, she opened doors for uh, other women. And by the end of the seventies into the early eighties, there were now several more women who were giving, who were being given opportunities to direct. And of course, their numbers just kept advancing. And, so she's recognized as a pioneer. And that film, because it's such an authentic representation of that slice of life in that period, is, is viewed as a very important documentary, even though it's a dramatic fictional film, documentary look at, at, at that time and place and those experiences. And so I, I have often said in interviews and in talks that I give that as great a filmmaker as Alexander Payne is, unquestionably, Joan Micklin Silver is a more important filmmaker for, for this pioneering role that, that she played. Very interesting. Well, we look forward to uh, reading that one when it is ready, and hopefully we can have you back on the show to talk more about it. But as we wrap up today's show, uh, going back to the article from the winter issue here in 2023, you know, as a writer, you are very familiar with the, the red ink, the, the editing floor. Not everything always makes it into the final product. Is there anything that you'd like to share from what you researched uh, about the rain people that maybe originally was in the, uh, the first draft of the article, but maybe didn't make it into the publication? It's interesting that you should ask that, Chris. So yes, I am very familiar with, with, with that process, of course. <laughs> so as it turned out, I had so much material. And because I'm a freelancer by trade, I, I contribute articles to, to different media platforms. I actually ended up writing two separate, distinct articles on the same subject, on this, this experience of Hollywood coming to Ogallala. And so the first of those appeared in Flatwater Free Press. And then the second, which a much more in-depth telling of the story, appeared in Nebraska History Magazine. And so between the two, I was able to pretty much... 
<laughs> include everything that I wanted. I couldn't get everything in a single story, but between the two, I, I pretty much got everything in there. You know, you know, it, it's uh, it's it's one of those chapters of of America uh, of Nebraska history that definitely is little known. And and by the way, I I had been wanting to tell the story in some way, shape, or form for um, decades. <laughs> I first became aware of the experience in an Omaha World Herald magazine in the Midlands article. That magazine doesn't even exist anymore. And this was before I was even a journalist, but I was a film buff and doing film programming. And so I eventually got to the point where I interviewed most of the principal people involved, including Coppola and Duvall and Kahn and Knight and Butler and, and, and so on. And, and so finally, after many years of sitting on this story and this, this material, I was able to, you know, to put it together and, and share it with the world. And thanks to David Bristow and Nebraska History Magazine for uh, allowing me to do that. Well, you can read the article yourself when Hollywood came to Western Nebraska in 1968 in the winter issue of the 2023 Nebraska History Magazine. It's a fantastic article and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time not only to write it and to find multiple outlets to get that whole story out there, but also uh, sharing some of your time today to talk about the article and uh, uh, giving people an understanding of how Probably one of the most uh, important films to open the door to some more iconic movies coming out of a Hollywood in the 1970s. A portion of it was filmed right here in Nebraska. So, Leo, thank you again for the time. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Thanks again, Chris. Yeah, I, I hope your uh, your listeners check out the article and uh, and maybe find a new appreciation for uh, the state and its uh, relationship with uh, with cinema. My thanks again to Leo Adambiga for joining us on the show today. And thank you for listening to the Nebraska History Podcast. To learn more about the Nebraska History Magazine, to listen to more podcasts, or to support our podcast by becoming a member of History Nebraska, go to history.nebraska.gov slash podcast. Until next time, for History Nebraska, I'm Chris Goforth.